Welcome. My name is Laura Arricchio. I'm uh, the Dean of the School of Undergraduate Studies here at the New School, and I am utterly delighted to uh, welcome Elizabeth Greenspan and all of you here this evening. This is an incredibly important event, and I am truly honored to be a part of it. Um, as I was saying to Elizabeth before, just before we began, um, I am actually personally a third generation New Yorker, and so um, the World Trade Center Memorial, the debates around it have been very personal for me. And um, so I am fascinated and grateful to Elizabeth for doing this work um, in part as a New Yorker, but also in part as a human being, and also in part as an art historian who works a lot on public art. And I've actually uh, taught some of the debates around this project in my classes. So I am truly grateful and I think it's an immensely important project and one that we're honored to have here. I also just wanted to thank um, Alexandra Delano, who is the interim chair of the Global Studies program here. The other exciting thing about this particular evening for those of us at the New School is that this is a project that is co-sponsored by four interdisciplinary programs that um, I have the great privilege of working with. And they're global studies, design, uh, sorry, global studies, urban studies, urban design, and environmental studies. And it's wonderful that all of these groups have come together to converge upon this very important topic. So I just wanted to thank all of you for coming out. And uh, please join me in welcoming Alexandra, who will introduce Elizabeth. Thank you so much, and, and thank you, Laura. Um, so welcome again on behalf of uh, our programs, Global Studies, Urban Studies, Environmental Studies, and Urban Design. It is a true pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today and to have the opportunity to engage with all of you in a conversation about Ground Zero, especially on the eve of the 12th anniversary of an event then that marked us all no matter where we're from or whether we were in New York at that time or not, it's an event that has uh, global implications that has touched us all in different ways and it's wonderful to have an opportunity to talk about it today. Um, Elizabeth's, Elizabeth Greenspan's timely book titled Battle for Ground Zero Inside the Political Struggle to Rebuild the World Trade Center comes at a moment when most of, some of the most controversial aspects of the site are complete or almost complete even though the debates around them will likely continue for many years. Many of us have already visited the memorial since its opening to the public two years ago. World Trade Center One, previously known as the Freedom Tower, can now be seen from almost anywhere in the city. And if you have an opportunity, uh, we have some great views from the new school buildings of, of the site from some of our windows. And the Memorial Museum is set to open in just a few months. In this book, Elizabeth Greenspan focuses on the big stakes of the rebuilding process and the battles that have taken place over the past 12 years to get to where we are today. Since 2001, she has documented the changes that have taken place at the site, the decisions that have influenced these processes, and the n different actors involved. Her reports draw from numerous visits to Ground Zero, documentation of graffiti messages left in various places around the city, which she interprets as messages that weren't just about sympathy, but also making claims upon the land. Um, she also looks at sp spontaneous memorials that were placed in the area for many years, ceremonies and protests that have taken place at or near the site, including recent debates about the Islamic Center and even Occupy Wall Street. Her thorough documentation of the discussions and controversies that have marked the site for over a decade, some of which go even further back to when the first Twin Towers were built, is also based on interviews with more than 300 people at the World Trade Center site, more than 150 downtown residents, victims, family members, rescue workers and architects, and nearly 50 city and state officials involved in the rebuilding, including politicians, architects, and developers making key decisions, some of the most interesting 
um, interviews or insights uh, from interviews come from people like Larry Silverstein, the developer, Michael Arad, the architect that designed the memorial, Dan Daniel Libskin, the architect that designed the original Freedom Tower and the layout of Ground Zero, Governor George Pataki, the staff of the 9-11 Memorial Museum, and visitors to the site, all of which had deep conversations with Elizabeth about these issues over a long period of time. Elizabeth also participated in civic group meetings and public hearings. She met residents, city architects, victims, families, and rescue workers, not only on, at the site, also sometimes at their homes. Um, all of this provides a really fascinating and thorough account of the many levels at which this debate has taken place over what should be built, how the decisions should be made, and more importantly, what these different choices say about the United States. One refrain in particular that she captures, uh, that she captured on a bordered up bank entrance across from Ground Zero read, America the Rebuildiful. And it is used as a metaphor throughout the book in her words, because this captures the idealistic unifying spirit of the times and the idea that the identity of the country was inextricably tied to the rebuilding of the World Trade Center site. It seemed at the time that whatever was built there would reveal nothing less than, one, than what makes us American, which makes it such an interesting site to explore at so many levels. So this is a story of the multiple forces that remade the World Trade Center. It's about land developers, it's about politicians, but it's also about people on the streets, public hearings, discussions in living rooms that were voicing competing beliefs, desires, demands, and concerns. And these included from revenge to the idea of a bigger, taller, and stronger World Trade Center, to national myths about strength and power, alongside ideas of rebirth, peace, empathy, the latest in green design, commercial space, concerns about the treatment of human remains at the site, affordable housing, housing and even beyond that, thinking about the fact that this wasn't just a national debate, but that the world should be somehow included in the discussion about rebuilding, given the nature of the events and the fact that so many foreign nationals died at the site. Although this book captures in great part a story of dysfunction, messiness, politics, power, and money, at the end, Elizabeth reminds us that it is also, in her words, a story of public engagement and expression, which is also always messy, as well as persistence, compromise, and luck. It was a story of how things worked and how things didn't work at the turn of the 21st century America. It raises important and complex questions about this city, about this country, as well as larger questions about urban planning, memorialization, and processes of rebuilding in the aftermath of disaster in cities across the globe. Elizabeth is a writer and urban anthropologist that cur she currently teaches at Harvard University. She has been researching and following the rebuilding process since 2001, like I said, and her writing on this topic has been published by The Atlantic Online, The Washington Post, and The Harvard Review, among other publications. She has lectured about Ground Zero and 9-11 at numerous colleges and universities around the country, and we are delighted to add the new school to that list today. Thank you very much for joining us today, and thank you, Elizabeth, for being here. All right. Um, what I thought I would do um, is not deliver a formal talk, but instead tell you a little bit about the project, um, particularly from the early years, how I started it and how I've thought about the rebuilding process and all of the controversies and debates that have unfolded. And I'll just show you some photographs. So one of the aspects of my research has been to take photographs of the site since 2001, um, so you can see the space evolving over time. And then I'll read a bit from the book and show more pictures, um, and then we can open it up and have a discussion. So I, I first went downtown um, in November of 2001 when I was a graduate student studying cities. And this is just a map of the space as I found it. The red line marks the area where the city had erected temporary walls around the wreckage. So you can see the the actual site there, the 16-acre piece of land, but then a much larger area was cordoned off by officials. And thousands of people by November were congregating downtown. People were coming from all over just to see the wreckage. This was one particularly um, 
one spot where you could really uh, see the remnant of the North Tower. People were taking photographs. People would stand in line to take pictures. And people were also bringing things. And this stood out to me most of all, just the thousands upon thousands of objects that people were bringing. Um, St. Paul's Chapel, some of you may know downtown, became the largest public shrine at the site. People took off hats they were wearing, even t-shirts. This is one uh, from France in the corner. This is just to give you a sense of the immensity of the outpouring, and it wasn't going away. So this, these photographs are from July of 2002, nearly a year after 9-11. So more and more people were coming and more and more people were bringing things. This is just one example, a flag from San Francisco came across the country, was not very far from a flag that came from Italy. So people were also coming from countries outside the US. And in addition to the shrines, people were writing on literally every surface that was there, every, every temporary space. Um, here's just a few examples, again, in multiple languages um, from people who are coming to see. And by and large, most of the commentary at this time, in these early months, people were lending support. They were you know, expressing their love. Um, but it wasn't exclusively expressions of love and peace. And so this is a, you know, a railing across from St. Paul's Chapel, bomb Afghanistan. On one sign that was directing people, someone had written kill Islam, but then others came and crossed it out. And so this caught my attention in part because we started to see the beginnings of a dialogue. People want, you know, someone was leaving something and then others were coming and expressing their own thoughts alongside it. This is one of my favorites. Um, Someone wrote, our grief is not a cry of war, to which another responded, fuck you, you left-wing coward piece of shit. And uh, I don't know, this really, to me, represents the kind of politics of the time and a certain sentiment and our, of where the country was at. Um, and so I saw this space, and I was just really struck by the energy and the life that was going on in the streets around the World Trade Center site and the way that people had taken them over. You know, no one was telling anyone to do this. No one was regulating these spaces. It was purely a public effort that was just unfolding by virtue of the really unique circumstances of, of downtown at the time. There were more police in this one area of New York probably than any other, and yet they weren't stopping this. They weren't telling people not to write because there were other things to think about, right? They were, they were patrolling the site as rescue workers were clearing wreckage. So I watched this and I became interested in this space at the same time that I became very aware that this wasn't a public space at all. Um, this was a piece of land, the World Trade Center, that's owned by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, and you see gentlemen um, standing as the, uh, this was a photograph from 2001, Governor Pataki is seated, and the, the Port Authority is run by the governors of New Jersey and New York, and in the middle, standing, signing, is Larry Silverstein, a New York City developer who purchased the lease to the office space six weeks before 9-11. It was 10 million square feet of office space that he purchased um, and then was completely destroyed. And so you had a brand new public-private partnership that was overseeing this complex, the largest office complex in the country, uh, at, at the, and, and they were working you know, frantically trying to figure out both how to respond to the tragedy and how to clear the wreckage, but also how to rebuild their office space. This was important. All of the men at this table believed in replacing the office space primarily to secure Lower Manhattan's status in the financial marketplace after 9-11. They worried about economic results um, you know, affecting the city, and if they could make sure that people didn't get afraid that businesses would be losing, that this would remain a financial hub, um, that, that was a really important goal of theirs. So getting the office space rebuilt was primary importance. At the same time that millions of people were coming from around the country and the world to see this space, express their own thoughts about it, and think about 9-11. So this became the primary dynamic through which I understood many of the conflicts and battles that unfolded over the past 12 years between this desire and emerging public square on the one hand and this public-private partnership on the other where 
and, and the way that those decisions unfolded. So you had, I mean, both sides were far from homogenous. You had victims' families and downtown residents and Americans and architects all discussing in a public space and in town hall meetings what this land meant and what it should be. And then you also had developers and politicians meeting behind closed doors, discussing what they wanted, and they too would fight. Years of battles between Larry Silverstein and the Port Authority would unfold. So you had battles within these groups, but then you also had battles across. Um, and this also, you know, as I, as I followed this, I came to see this really as a primary dynamic in American life. What, um, you know, what, does the what can the public claim ownership of and what belongs more in the private sphere when we think about what should be private de privately developed? So Ground Zero is a very unique circ situation and circumstance, but I think by looking at it, we can learn quite a bit about how we find this balance between public and private in American life right now and how some of these decisions and negotiations were made. And what I wanted to do now is to share one particular story with you from the book that I think really illustrates this and that I've continued to think about that remains a kind of open question for me. Um, and so I wanted to share my thoughts and questions with you. And I'm going to start by reading just a bit from the book, since it frames this. It's about a fence. To redevelop Ground Zero quickly, as was their plan, the Port Authority and Larry Silverstein needed to do a number of things efficiently, including hire architects, design buildings, prepare the sites, construct underground infrastructure, hire contractors, and find tenants. Before they could do any of this, however, they needed to do something even more difficult transform Ground Zero into a construction zone. After eight months of towering wreckage, spontaneous memorials, crowds, vendors, and viewing platforms, Ground Zero had become a very distinctive place, and people were still arriving to remember and grieve. Change was a delicate proposition. Rebuilding officials first signaled change with a solemn ceremony in late May 2002, when Governor Pataki declared the end of recovery operations. On a late weekday morning at Ground Zero, sorrowful bagpipes filled the air as a steady line of soldiers marched two by two out of the hole. Thousands of people filled the sidewalks and stood on tiptoes to photograph the procession, pausing to wipe away tears under sunglasses. Flashes of light popped from the camera-draped crowds on nearby rooftops. After the last soldiers emerged, a single empty coffin draped in an American flag rolled up the ramp on the back of a flatbed truck. The ceremony signaled that the recovery of human remains at Ground Zero was officially over. But officially was the operative word. Recovery was not, in fact, complete. Workers continued to find pieces of body parts and microscopic traces of flesh at and around Ground Zero for years. Indeed, given the nature of the violence and ever-improving technologies, the discovery and identification of remains will likely continue for decades. But many human remains had been found, and more pragmatically, construction couldn't begin in the midst of an active recovery operation. So the ceremony marked the recovery's relative end and provided an opportunity for people to collectively express their grief and perhaps to begin to move on. The ceremony signaled that the time for thinking of Ground Zero, first and foremost, as a somber space of death and loss was coming to an end. In addition to the ceremony, the Port Authority also planned to build a new structure around the World Trade Center site, something to stand for five to 10 years as it rebuilt. Officials first announced news of this structure in March, on the eve of the sixth anniversary of the attacks, when Governor Pataki and Mayor Bloomberg held a joint press conference to announce the fast pace of cleanup and recovery work. In the first weeks after the attacks, officials estimated that cleanup would take at least one year, likely longer. But firefighters and paramedics worked through the holidays in the winter cold, laboring in the pit 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and made faster progress than anyone anticipated. After Pataki and Bloomberg celebrated the news of the rapid cleanup, another official announced a series of upcoming changes to the site. The tattered temporary plywood walls that had gone up the prior September would come down, he said, and the Port Authority would soon build a solid 30 to 40 foot high wall around the hole. The official took a moment to justify the choice of an opaque wall, explaining that it would, quote, protect those who lived and worked in the area from seeing disconcerting views as they walked through Lower Manhattan. It seemed simple enough. There would be a wall to mark the edge of the hole. But the comments about protecting people suggested something more complicated and more carefully considered, 
This wasn't a regular wall, after all. It was a wall at ground zero, where nothing was simply what it appeared to be. Minutes after the press conference ended, city architects shot off two and three line emails across listservs to notify colleagues. Ground zero was going to be walled off for the rest of the decade. The wall was the stupidest thing I heard, architect Rick Bell told me. Bell and his colleagues at New York New Vision saw a solid 30 foot tall wall as a direct affront to one of their most important goals, a democratic rebuilding process. Bell dismissed the notion that a wall would protect people. Downtown employees and residents lived and worked in tall buildings, he told me, looking out at windows into and across the World Trade Center site all the time. A wall would hardly prevent their sight lines. Rather, Bell believed the primary function of the wall was to restrict the public's view. The viewing platform demonstrated that people were coming from all over the world to connect with this place, he said. By cutting off these views, he thought the Port Authority aimed to stem the public's access and by extension their voice in what would happen to it. A wall was a symbol of exclusion and secrecy, and not inconsequentially, it would literally prevent anyone from wandering by and taking a look at what the Port Authority and Larry Silverstein were building. New York New Visions appealed to the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation and Alex Garvin, an architecture professor at Yale who had recently been appointed as the organization's vice president of planning. Garvin agreed that the wall was foreboding and problematic and encouraged New York New Visions to come up with an alternative design. In late March, 12 architects spent a weekend at the Van Allen Institute to revamp the Port Authority's proposal. If, as New York New Visions believed, the Port Authority's wall aimed to restrict public engagement, this new design was all about encouraging it. In place of the opaque wall, they imagined a structure that emphasized transparency and openness, landscape architect Deanna Belmori told me. Their design featured a 12-foot tall fence, a height more to scale for visitors, made of stainless steel mesh that welcomed people to view Ground Zero from multiple angles. It incorporated small ledges hanging from the fence so people could continue to leave homemade memorials, as well as signs explaining that the memorials would be collected and archived by state officials. The fence also held white erasable panels with markers for people to continue to leave their own comments, signatures, and drawings. Victims' families had ideas about the wall fence too. When Alex Garvin and the LMDC presented New York New Vision's design to its victims' family advisory group, the group said that any new structure at the site, particularly something that would stand for five or ten years, must include a memorial to the attack's victims. This was the place, they reminded everyone, where nearly 3,000 people were killed. Many families were already worried that the Port Authority was not invested in a significant memorial, and news of a bare wall only amplified their concern. The Advisory Council requested a series of panels listing all victims' names. The Port Authority said it was completely surprised by the negative reaction. It had imagined nothing more and nothing less than an opaque wall. The Port Authority's response to the LMDC's proposal, however, suggested that it understood something more was at stake. After the architects revolted against the wall, the Port Authority agreed to build a fence instead, something that people could see through, but it refused to adopt a number of the recommendations. We didn't want anyone calling it a memorial. It was a construction fence, Mark Wagner, a consultant to the Port Authority who spent his summer dedicated to finding a solution to the wall fence to do, explained to me. The Port Authority's goal, he said, was to build a structure that no one missed when it came down years later to make way for office buildings, a permanent memorial, a train station, and more. An elaborate commemorative fence designed to encourage civic engagement and public expression was precisely the kind of thing the Port Authority wanted to avoid. It feared that a fence full of memorials and handwritten notes could engender a sense of attachment, and this in turn could complicate its plans to redevelop the land. We wanted to maintain the fact that it was temporary, Mark told me. Giving people a place to leave a teddy bear, that would make it permanent. And so we went from a place filled with public expression and engagement and to a stainless, or a not a stainless steel, but a, a metal fence that surrounded the site. And I'll just show you a few photographs. There were, now there were, um, you know, little plates telling people about the restricted activities in the area, including please do not write anywhere on the viewing fence, and telling people that all of their memorials would be removed if they were left behind. 
Mark also told me that they actually thought a lot about the metal that they used to create the fence and that stainless steel would have been the typical metal, but they thought stainless steel looked permanent. So they picked a different metal that they thought looked cheaper, but probably actually cost them more money to create this effect of a temporary structure. Um, people, of course, continued to write on the structure, but not to the extent that they had been before. And so most people congregated to this one, this was the one non-policed space left across, this is on Liberty Street that was still blocked off, but pedestrians had access. And there was one tunnel, and so everyone started leaving comments here. And a lot of them also started to collect the kind of political commentary of the day. Uh, so the Port Authority painted over it very quickly, and you, can still see, you could still see remnants underneath. So within weeks, everyone was back, adding a new layer of writing on top of what had been painted over. And finally, a few months later, the Port Authority uh, figured it out that they had to paint the wall black, and this finally stopped all public expression at Ground Zero. Um, this was in 2003. In addition to barring memorials and clearing those spaces, they also created a series of photographic panels that hung from the fence. So they added their own narrative to this space. And it was basically, it was 33 panels that filled a two block stretch downtown that told a history of the economic development of Lower Manhattan. So you could walk the length of city blocks and see the skyline change these images and see the Twin Towers slowly rise. So you have from 1915 going to the 1970s where you start to see the Twin Towers um, here again. And, um, and then there was one panel that documented the destruction on September 11th. And this just is, gives you a bit of sense of the kind of text that they were using. Beyond this wall, the Twin Towers once soared to the heavens. Since 1973, they were international centers of commerce. To stand in their shadows or to witness their imprint on the skyline was to marvel at the ingenuity and determination of the American spirit. So I think the fence you know, has been interesting to me uh, for a number of reasons. It was the first story. It was the first real linear narrative to, f to appear at Ground Zero and to frame the meaning of 9-11. And it was a very explicit framing connecting 9-11 to rebuilding, to American power and innovation, and basically suggesting that the only way to reclaim American strength and power was to rebuild something just as tall, just as iconic in the skyline. And um, I think it also showed a real sophistication on the part of the Port Authority with not allowing people to leave home in memorials and, and all of the thinking about something, fears that something temporary could become permanent. I mean, it's hard to know if that actually would have happened, but um, their sense that people could become attached to a space that they left something, just even as small as of a bouquet, I think showed a certain kind of insight into human activity that was far more sophisticated than we may think for uh, Port Authority builders. And whether it would have happened or not, you know, the fence was there for many years. It came down many years ago, and nobody said a word about it. So perhaps um, they were correct. <laughs> I don't, we don't know. Um, I've thought a lot about, too, about this the move from the creating a wall, you know, walling off this space versus creating something that people could see through. And this too seemed like, a, at first, has seemed like a really smart and sophisticated move. I think people would have really reacted negatively to this walling off of the site. And I think it would have generated, could have generated real significant resistance to plans to develop the site at that time. So the Port Authority seemed to understand that they needed to revamp and that, they, that this was a public space and that they had to give people some kind of access to it, but that they, couldn't, they weren't going to give them unmediated access. They were going to kind of use the idea that this was public and give a certain story that helped them advance their goals, framing it in a positive way. Um, and so I think there was maybe a bit of compromise here. I mean, this is something that I've been wondering and thinking through, um, and I'm not so sure. I mean, I've been following you know, debate some of you are interested in public space from this summer, thinking about the resistance that unfolded in Turkey in Taksim Square, where there was going to be developed. We didn't see that kind of violence or protest at Ground Zero when there were plans to, to significantly commercially develop the site. And there are probably lots of reasons for that. But I think one may be this willingness 
to respond at least in part or just enough to answer civic architects' concerns and to give people a little bit of something to respond to while also protecting their interests at the same time. Um, but I also think the wall, going from the wall to fence is interesting. And maybe it's not a disjuncture. More late, lately, I've been thinking that the wall, I've been struck by this idea that they were building a wall to protect people, which seemed kind of strange to me at the time. But maybe, you know, but maybe it was something that they, you know, this was the Port Authority telling everyone, we will protect you. You don't have to see the space that will upset, possibly upset you. No one trusted the Port Authority. No one trusted their, the motives behind that. And so they came up with point with uh, approach number two, which was instead of protecting you, we will restore America's greatness in this one piece of land. That was the kind of try number two, which seemed to work. And that was a much more persuasive argument for people. And people were willing to get behind that. And I mean, it's so obvious. It sounds, I think it now, looking back, we can see how a lot of the rhetoric merged very seamlessly with the rebuilding of the site. But because it wasn't their first attempt at it, I think that, you know, that reveals some of the thinking and the strategy on their part. And, and it also suggests just how many different ways this could have unfolded. We take for granted that we had to rebuild office towers um, and we had to rebuild something tall and iconic. But there may have been different options. And I think just this little story and this anecdote raises a lot of those questions for me. Um, so I am going to stop there. These are just a few more pictures that take us through uh, the years. This is from 2010, when you can start to see the Memorial Plaza emerging. And down here is the eastern bathtub where more office towers will go. And then this is the memorial, which many of you have been to now open. Oops. And uh, yeah. I will, um, I'm happy to take questions, talk about other aspects of the site. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Very interesting talk. Uh, I, I, one question though, I, I don't know if it was beyond the scope of your study, but uh, in the Ground Zero area, there's the St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church that uh, was a subject of uh, a lot of controversy between uh, the church and the Port Authority and the governor, and finally the governor settled it. Uh, and uh, was that addressed at all? I, and why could you care to comment? I'd be very curious. So, I know you could write a book about it. Probably. <laughs> yeah. There were, so I, I didn't get too, in too much into depth into the Greek Orthodox Church. Partly, one of the ways that I helped limit this project and just to make it more manageable was to focus exclusively on Ground Zero. Um, because there were so many battles and controversies on other pieces of land. So I don't have as much to say. And maybe there are some others here that can answer that question. But, um, but it was very political and it went on for many years um, as so many of these of these have. Um, uh, so I came in a little late, so sorry to use the report. Um, what's the decision making process at the Port Authority? Excuse me. What's it at the Port Authority? Yeah. Um, uh, did you hear that? The decision making process at the Port Authority. Yeah. yeah well, in general, the, um, so the governors, the two governors of New York and New Jersey oversee the Port Authority. Okay. And they appoint an executive director. So, but otherwise, the Port Authority is a completely independent organization and it has its own budget. It decides how it will disperse its funds. So it is protected from a certain kind of public oversight, except for the governor's involvement. And after 9-11, Pataki had a lot of, you know, he was much more involved in the Port Authority's decision making over at Ground Zero than uh, the New Jersey governor, who was McGreevy for a brief period, and then there were many others. Um, so the Port Authority, so that's what made it partly complicated, is you didn't have, there were no public officials. That, you know, the Port Authority wasn't really accountable to anyone. It could, and it, and it was, had this partnership with Larry Silverstein, who owned the commercial space. So that was the primary nexus of decision making. It was the Port Authority and Larry Silverstein working base early on to make sure they rebuilt their office space. And then the rest of the pieces, like the memorial and the train station, those came into, into play. Do you know the name of the chair, the executive chairman of 
Oh, um, <laughs> he was killed. Yeah, the, you're right. Um, Levin was his last name. He was killed, and so there was uh, an appointed chair. And then Chris Ward eventually became uh, the Port Authority chairman for a crucial set of years in 2008, 2010. But there were many, there were many chairs. Uh, from your conversation with Michael Arad, mm -hmm. what was the inspiration to this particular monument? Yeah, so um, Michael Arad uh, told me that he started designing the memorial within weeks after 9-11. And he was really struck as a New Yorker by the absence of the Twin Towers in the skyline, as I think a lot of people were, and the sense of these footprints. You know, he said he had this image of the Twin Towers footprints just kind of their absence because they were no longer there. And for him at first, he thought about a lot about water, which I think a lot of landscape architects and memorial architects are playing around and have been for some time with water and the fluidity of water. So he actually imagined, as he's described it, voids in the Hudson River. These, the, the, somehow he could carve out these square footprints of the Twin Towers in the Hudson and have them reflect the footprints of the standing tall Twin Towers. And he was playing around with this idea. He made some models. And then the competition for the memorial was announced. And he decided to enter. And he moved these voids from the Hudson onto the actual footprints of the site itself. And so that was the basic concept. It was, it was basic. And it kind of, in some ways, it complemented the, um, already the guidelines of the memorial competition. One of the requirements was that the footprints be marked in some way because they had become very important to many victims' families and to many New Yorkers. And so his vision kind of immediately complemented the requirement and then he worked and developed it further. But that core concept was something that kind of came to him very early on. Um, do you know if the Memorial Plaza is ever going to have open access without having to get a ticket and go through a metal yeah. detector? I mean, that's the plan. <laughs> I think that's what some people hope, but I think it's going to take a long time because, as you saw, construction surrounds it, and construction on those towers that Larry Silverstein is building on the Eastern Bathtub will take at least another five years, and so I can't imagine they will be having free-flowing public access until most of that construction is done, and they... I mean, that's, I know that's a goal, and I know I was talking to Michael Arad about this, and he feels very strongly that, you know, in order to honor his vision, that this be an open public space that is seamlessly connected to the community downtown. Daniel Liebeskin feels the same way, I and mean, I know architects and a number of civic groups feel this way, but working with the construction and safety concerns has created some, so I think it's going to take years. I mean, hopefully that happens, but... Yeah. You mentioned that the debates have continued even today after the memorial site is open to the public. Do you feel that Hurricane Sandy influenced the debates in any important way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I just came um, earlier in the day. I was downtown speaking at um, a forum of 9-11 family members and rescue workers and survivors. And one of them asked the very same question. And they're very concerned that the whole site will become flooded at some point, And that the rebuilding and that the planners have not sufficiently accounted for this. I'm sure all of you saw the pictures of the water flooding. Um, the, under, and the, the museum is underground, and a lot of the artifacts are housed underground. And so they have done some work to try to protect that area, but I think it remains an open question. And um, I don't know the absolute latest on what they've done, but um, it, you're not the only one <laughs> who's concerned about this. But at this point, you know, the museum is underground, and um, it will that's the only space for it. So <clears throat> you talked about how part of what made the Port Authority's decisions successful in a way was, was compromise, right? Yeah. Um, but it seems to me reading the whole book and the story that, that some of the hard fought battles about some of the symbolic aspects of the site sort of took a back seat towards the end mm -hmm. and that the commercial interests and security concerns that at the beginning were sort of more hidden because people were reacting more to them, they took over mm -hmm. without much reaction. For example, um, that the Freedom Tower was first designed to resemble the Statue of Liberty and right. that it was called the Freedom Tower and then right. moving away from that or certain aspects of the Memorial Plaza like uh, this gentleman was talking about the, the 
entrance with mm -hmm. a security checkpoint that is almost like an airport. <laughs> um, so security and commercial interests have become very prominent at the mm -hmm. site without yeah. a reaction, whereas those symbolic aspects and the, and the concerns of the families victims of only making it a memorial plaza rather than everything else that is around it sort of took a back seat. So what do you think shifted this balance and what does it mean, especially if what you're saying here is that this site reflects so much about what the United States is about. So yeah. how do you think this reflects on that? Well, I think at some, for some of these, I mean, history intervened. I think there was a desire early on. Daniel Libeskin had this, if some of you saw the images of his tower with these asymmetries and angles and this twisting spire that echoed the Statue of Liberty. I mean, it was a completely unconventional skyscraper. And um, so part of that was a commercial pressure to make it more conventional and have more office space. But then if you're building something that's going to be the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere, a site that's been attacked twice, it's in some ways, it's almost inevitable that there's going to be security concern and they're going to have to really fortify the building. So there's something, I mean, it was hard for me not to find incredible layers of meaning in the fact that this had been designed as the Statue of Liberty and that they actually had to remove those features in order to make it safe. <laughs> it just seemed like such a statement on what we've been struggling with today is how do we balance our kind of ideals and our efforts to celebrate them with our fears, and if you're building, making such a symbolic statement on this piece of land, you know, this is one of the compromises that um, I think certainly the New York, the NYPD feels they have to make. Um, and um, yeah, so history, I mean, I see that as, that's that's reflects the history of 9-11 and, you know, how, how we've responded to it. And I think, but I also think what you were saying about people moving on from some of these battles, I think that's true for those who are in power and those who've made a lot of decisions. They've decided that they're moving on. And in some, and a lot of New Yorkers and Americans, I mean, they support that. We want, a lot of people just want this to be done. I think that's the sentiment that I've, that I've found from a lot of people. Um, all the politics, all the symbolism, that's fine, but they want this finished. But for a lot of people, like a lot of families that I spoke to this afternoon, I mean, they have not moved on. And the question of ownership and the symbolism is still very strong for them. So I think people are at different places. Um, in terms of the, their thinking at this place, of this place. Um, immediately after, well, not immediately, but pretty soon after the buildings came down, there was uh, a pretty significant movement of uh, people that wanted to rebuild the towers exactly as they were, mm -hmm. and um, that didn't happen. Uh, I was wondering if you, if you had any insight into that and if you could comment on that at all. Yeah, they, there was. Um, I mean, I think they did a, uh, there was a poll that was, that's been cited a lot that at one point half of all New Yorkers said that they wanted to rebuild the towers exactly as they were. Um, and then, but very quickly, I think those numbers changed. But there was, there have been a couple of groups that formed. Team Twin Towers was one of them. And a lot of the early meetings that I went to, they were handing out pins and paraphernalia, and they were collecting signatures. And there was a real movement to rebuild them. And they, and um, some of them are still upset that the Twin Towers were not rebuilt. And um, I mean, I, as an anthropologist looking at that, um, it seemed to me, I mean, it was, it seemed to represent a desire to almost deny that it had happened. I mean, if, if there was an ability to put back exactly what had been taken down, it was almost as if we could say, well, this didn't happen. And, and I think that, and that's something that I found actually about the rebuilding process as a whole, that one of the reasons why it's been so important to rebuild is not, not to say that it didn't happen, but to move on in some way. And I think um, that's, we take for granted, but of course we can never, it will never have not happened. And so there's a little bit of a disconnect there between the desires to make this place whole and to rebuild a tall size, a tall skyscraper again. You know, the, so team, twi team Twin Towers and others represent almost the most extreme version of that for me of saying like, you can't do this to us, this didn't happen and we, will, we can go on as though it didn't. Hi, is this thing? Hello, Tess. Hi. Okay, um, have you spoke with any of the families of the victims? Do you feel like they're happy with the complex, how it turned out, how they opened it up? So there are streets going through it now and there is a memorial, but yet there are buildings like 
How do they feel about that? Yeah, um, so it's mixed. You know, uh, some family members are very happy. They're pleased with the memorial and that it does occupy so much space. So the memorial um, takes up eight acres of land, which is half of the site, and then office buildings occupy the other eight acres. So, and I know I was talking to Michael Arad about this too, and he, his take on it was, well, maybe, you know, it, it would be better if office space hadn't been so prioritized, but having an eight acre park and public space in New York City isn't so bad. And we could see that and thinking about compromise as, as a sort of victory. Um, so I think family victims' families, many of them are happy with that. They're happy to have the names around the pools and to have them at ground level. That was something that a lot of families felt strongly about. But I also have been getting emails from some victims' families who are not happy. Um, one of the things that many wanted were to have remnants from the wreckage displayed on the plaza. So they'd like some of the twisted steel or the crushed fire trucks. And um, because this represented really what happened on 9-11. And a lot of them have told me that they see the space as a little too sanitized and clean and that it doesn't really represent, there's no sense of what happened before and that it's a nice place and it's serene and it's peaceful. But for them, that's, are really that is in dissonance with what they remember and what they want others to remember. And so all of those artifacts will be um, at, in the museum underground, but again, they're not at the street level. So that was something that I've heard that from a few people. So I think, you know, it's mixed perceptions. Oh, let's see, someone has the microphone with that. Um, uh, thank you very much for being here, for writing this book and being here tonight uh, after 12 years. Uh, Remembrance. Um, I have actually, if I may, two, two independent questions. The first one, we've all heard reasons and theories about why the name was changed from the Freedom Tower to One World Trade Center. What is your insight into uh, why it was changed? Okay. And the second question is Edie Lutnick, who was a sister of the two heads of Cantabus Gerald, uh, wrote an, uh, authored a book uh, also about the struggles that some of the families had with the establishment. Um, do you have any parallels between your book and her book or mm. any, anything that you can talk sure. about? Sure. Um, okay, so the name change. My understanding of it, and I'm curious if there are others, is that uh, Chris Ward was head of the Port Authority and he, this it was in 2008. The Freedom Tower was struggling. There were no tenants. Um, it was people were calling for it not to be built or not to be completed. And um, he took over at the Port Authority and he saw things very differently from a lot of leaders, including Pataki and others. And he really thought they needed to get rid of all of the symbolism and the layers of meaning that have been attached to this place because that was impeding just the ability to build a, sky a skyscraper, an office building, you know, that it should, an office building should be an office building and a train station be, it should be a train station. And that the symbolism so many had attached didn't, you know, there were eight acres for a memorial, and then we can talk about meaning there, but these other spaces needed to do, to perform their primary function. So he changed the name. It was the one thing he could do, right? The design had already been set, the construction was in motion, but something he had power over was this name, and so he made it the address to kind of, as he told me, to defrate it. And um, his understanding was that 9-11 had been kind of monument, or the World Trade Center site had been monumentalized in this way that was actually now getting in the way of construction. And so he wanted to remove that sense of monumentalism and just get it done. And so he called it One World Trade Center. And then a couple years later, he made worked with Durst family to get Condé Nast to go downtown from Times Square. So. Um, I don't, you know, is that because the name was changed? It's hard to say, but it did. But right now, people feel very differently about the future of One World Trade Center than they did about Freedom Tower. So that's my understanding of it, that it was mostly a business calculation on the part of the Port Authority, but also that, you know, Chris Ward, I think, just personally had no particular love for Freedom Tower, so he didn't feel um, bad about losing that name. That's my take. Um, and I do I know about uh, Edie, Lut Edie Lutnick's book, and she focuses primarily on the memorial. She focuses more on that, and the particularly negotiations with Mayor Bloomberg, who chaired the 9/11 Foundation. Um, but I don't. I have only read bits of the book, so I don't feel like I can comment. But my book aims to look at the my, the really the organizing 
piece for my book is the land itself. And, you know, and it goes back to some of these early debates about what the entire piece of land means and how we decide that and talk about it. Mm. So looking at the commercial development and the memorial is very important, rather than just looking at the memorial or the museum or the office towers separately. I think they all go together. Hi. Um, could, you, uh, could you comment on the length of time it took to get to where we are today and what it says about us? And also, if you can expand your discussion on how other tragedies were memorialized, mm -hmm. let's say, you know, like Hiroshima, for example. Yeah. Uh, I visited there, and I think they did a much better job of, um, <laughs> no, as a memorial because it was very, not very neutral, but yet very respectful. Huh. And Oklahoma City uh, would be the one close to us, but that right. was done very quickly and yeah. uh, compared to this. This right. Yeah, on. it's interesting to look at other sites. Um, Oklahoma City is a is one that a lot of people bring up. I don't know if you all are familiar, but they they uh, constructed a chair for every victim on on the piece of land where the tower um, ex there was a car bomb, and um, but there are some key differences. I mean, so that moved very swiftly, and for the most part, they operated by consensus. They really got everyone to agree on what the memorial should be and how they should move forward. There were 160 some victims, I think, in Oklahoma City compared to nearly 3,000 um, in New York. And so that's one major difference. Just the number of people who were killed, I think, made it a much more complicated process. But also, again, it comes back to this question of land and the fact that we're in New York. In Oklahoma City, they rebuilt the office building that was destroyed, the federal building, across the street. And so they just devoted the space of the piece of land to a memorial and to a museum. There's no place across the street in New York that you can go and build, you know, 10 million square feet of office space. And so there, the constraints because of the density of the city and the value of the piece of land meant that all of this had to happen on one piece of land. So all the office space that had been destroyed now had to also find a way to fit that in with a large memorial plaza. And, um, and in Hiroshima as well, my understanding, I haven't been there, is that they were free to really devote the space primarily to commemoration and history as opposed to meshing these commercial interests. Um, and, that, and that is different, you know? I mean, just like the number of players that you had here and the number of demands and motives and agendas becomes so much more complicated when you have these commercial and political and commemorative and cultural pieces going on, which is what makes this so interesting and important and I think so revealing about how we work and how we make decisions, because it had to be both. You know, it had to be commercial and it had to be commemorative. Yeah, I've got two quick questions. One, sure. um, talking about the remnants from the World Trade Center being underground in the museum. What about the globe? Mm -hmm. I always thought it'd be a great thing representing the Earth world, mm -hmm. and it was destroyed, but it survived, and it was in the plaza between the two towers. Wouldn't right. that, it's someplace in Battery Park, wouldn't that be a good thing to put mm -hmm. there? That's number one. Okay. And after all is said and done, and all the research you've done in the book you wrote, are you satisfied with the design and the whole thing, as, with all the different agendas yeah. and everything. Are you satisfied with this okay. final I'll, look? I'll answer the first one first. Um, so the Globe, uh, I know that there are some, there is a group working on getting the Globe to the plaza. Um, the victims, fam Some victims' families feel very strongly, some downtown residents do, but others don't. It's in Battery Park City. So I, one of the emails I received was from a gentleman who's spearheading that effort and says that he believes someday it will happen, <laughs> but um, it might take some time. And um, and my I I like I do like the memorial more than I thought I would um, because I think the pow seeing the footprints and seeing the the size like they just the immensity of the footprints was really powerful to me it was something that I you know you see pictures of the twin towers you see pictures of the footprints but being there in person um, was something I hadn't expected it was it's an incredibly large space and you're just kind of you know, to stand there and to, and then to see the names around them, the 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 um, those two pieces side by side, I thought worked really well and was very powerful. Um, I don't know yet about the site as a whole because it's under construction and the Freedom Tower is still going up. I was never, I never felt like building a skyscraper was as 
important as some others did. I mean, I, I understood the need to put something on the skyline and have a symbol and something there, but it, I felt like maybe we could have played around with that a little more and come up with some innovative options of something tall and that you could see from a distance, but that wasn't necessarily an office building. I mean, I don't know what that would be because we never really entertained that, but that, that seemed like something that could be cool. Um, so, so I do like the Memorial Plaza and I have to wait and see, and hopefully it will be open as you are saying, and hopefully we can have, it can be an integrated public space and that, you know, that's really important. Okay, um, I guess I have the microphone. Um, I, I wondered if you knew about um, the, uh, at the Javits Center in 2002, there yeah. was this big experiment with the community mm -hmm. with 4,000 people. And I was one of them, and it, what was interesting, and the tables had people that were from, from victim family members to people who worked that were in the towers, coming up with the idea of what a memorial should be. And then they had a, uh, you could vote instantly on mm -hmm. seven buildings that were selected by Silverstein, I think most of them. And what the group recommended was to get rid of Silverstein and get <laughs> the mayor in charge. And they voted down. What was fantastic was to have all those people, 4,000 people at once voting, and we voted every single proposal zero, <laughs> went down about 10% or less. Mm -hmm. So they did reopen the public a little bit. Do you know right. more about what Yeah, that so yeah, there's actually, I, I was there also. Uh -huh. okay. And um, so there's a chapter in the book that chronicles uh -huh. that process. And it was this really, just as you said, like the plans that they presented were just despised across the board and people voted them down and with like cheers erupted in the room as soon as like they showed that we all hated them. It was this like incredible celebratory moment and the Port Authority was shocked because, and they call, people called for the end of Silverstein's lease. Um, and this was a real problem because he had a lease. And um, I think according to conversations that I had with Pataki and others at the Port Authority, they thought about finding a way to get rid of Silverstein. They claimed that this was something they considered, but they knew that he would sue them if they tried to push him out. And they didn't want, they felt it was important to kind of move forward quickly again, this, this kind of neat forward motion. And so they didn't want this to be bogged down in litigation for years. And so they felt like for that reason, they had to keep Silverstein on board. So they basically couldn't honor the public request that was made at this hearing. And so the problem then was how do we go forward and claim that we're embracing a public process when we can't actually do any, any of the things that people have requested. And so that's when they had this international competition that brought Daniel Liebeskind in. But it was tricky because they actually didn't change any of the requirements. So they had Larry Silverstein's 10 million square feet of office space. And they just kind of took that from these old plans that were despised and put that into the international competition. And, but people didn't notice as much because you had architects like Daniel Liebeskin and Norman Foster suddenly imagining what you could do with all these office towers. And, and people were okay with that. They were kind of like, okay, well, if we can get buildings that look like this, maybe this is okay. And then came the big catch that Daniel Liebeskin and all these others weren't actually competing to design buildings. They were competing to be the master planner. And it was this technical distinction that was very confusing, but that basically meant he would be designing buildings as a kind of exercise for all of us to watch and see what the space might look like, but was not guaranteed to look like. And nobody understood this, and so people saw the plans and thought they looked exciting and were excited, many, not everyone, but many were excited about Daniel Liebeskin's vision. And then it became clear that actually Larry Silverstein had his own architects who he had already hired to design the buildings, and Liebeskin was not involved in that. And that's when you had years of battles between Liebeskin trying to get in, trying to get his buildings built, Larry Silverstein's architect David Childs was doing it. And so, I mean, part of it, it was like there was, a, there was public engagement, but the, they had never intended the public to have quite the say that everyone wanted, you know, that they believed, that the public believed it should have. So it created these complications um, that, you know, unfolded over the past 12 years. Uh, can I ask you about four questions? Okay. <laughs> and hopefully they'll be sure. Um, I, uh, I'm a teacher in, in the city high schools, and I, um, I have a side job as a, I'm licensed as a tour guide, so I get a lot of calls um, 
to do a 9-11 or a freedom tour, as they call it. Uh -huh. It's just very interesting because people will come up to me and say, um, what do you think really happened with building number seven? And yeah. so I have because I have patriots coming and people and skeptics coming. It's an interesting tour. I say, uh, talk to me away from the group. <laughs> and uh, but I was wondering a couple things here. Is security is supposed to come down at some point. Well, that's yeah. Someone else is asking that too. I mean, yeah, at some point it should be coming down. But um, I mean, the, the area will always be. I think there will always be a level of surveillance over this piece of land that is far greater than anywhere else in New York. And, but it should be through, cam I mean, they're hoping to have it be through cameras and the like, rather than, you know, blocked off. And so, but I think it's gonna be years before that happens because construction will be going on for years. Right, it just seems like, because I go through the security every yeah. time I do a tour, to not have no security there would seem uh, kind of qu uh, questionable right. as to what, so that's, um, did the Rockefellers have any uh, involvement uh, at this point? Um, they've this? given some money. I have one more. Oh, yeah. they've given some money, but they haven't been involved. They were involved in the initial building of the Twin Towers, David and Nelson Rockefeller. Um, okay. But this part, they have not been involved. Okay, and it's real quick. <laughs> Are people going to be able to go to the top of uh, Tower yeah. One? Yeah, there's going to be an observation deck on the 104th floor, from what I understand, and there's going to be a special elevator that doesn't stop in between. So it takes you from the bottom, shoots you up to the top in like 60 seconds or something like that. So. I had one question about uh, closure on this. Uh, do you think that because of all the public battles that they've had, uh, the commercial space versus the memorial, is that preventing closure from occurring for most people? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I guess I think the fact that there's been so much contention shows how unresolved this is for people and how there's a need to talk about it. Maybe not quite in this particular way and maybe not over these specific questions of office spaces, but I think there's a desire to engage and there are, and a lot of people, and I think it's just for the country, it's a very, it's hard to talk about 9-11. I think that we don't see a lot of really honest, open public debate about it. And so I think that's to me one of the lessons from this project. I think we've, we have figured out what will be built. You know, the decisions have been made. We were able to come to some compromises or, you know, some kind of understanding. And now it's just a question of executing. But, but construction will be finished, you know, in the next couple of years. But when thinking about what 9-11 means or, you know, how we responded as a country to the event, I think that remains very unresolved. And I don't think the rebuilding process helped us as much as we maybe thought it would come to some answers there. So I think those kind of debates will continue to play out. Is there? So we're gonna take three, three more okay. questions. So then we have time for you to join us for a reception and Elizabeth will be signing um, the books and you can have time to have a conversation with her. So just three more questions, please. And we'll, we'll take them together. Is that okay? okay? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Mine's a twofold, but it's easy. There was talk about having a cultural center down there with theater and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, is that still part of the, going to be part of the complex? And the other, my other part of the question is, uh, how is it going to connect to the financial center? Is it all going to be underground? Or are there still going to be bridges over West Street? Mm. Okay. Um, so uh, the cultural center is one of the question marks. Um, there's still a desire for it, and I, from my, what I believe, Frank Gehry is the architect who's been chosen. But um, it's not clear what it will be, and there's still some question of funding. I mean, that just as of the spring, they've been talking about it. So I know there are many people who care and feel, you know, strongly that it's there. But that too will probably, if it does arrive, it'll be another, you know, four to five years. I don't know, actually. I'm not sure. It's going to be underground. Okay. Okay. This, right. Yeah, there's one bridge. Yeah. There's one bridge. Let's see. Oh, um, well, I, I liked so much this uh, America, the rebuild of full. So, uh, uh, so many questions come out of it. Um, and especially noticing the theme that um, you presented early on in the presentation about this sort of n ongoing negotiation between the public sphere and a public-private partnership and sort of the attempts to pacify the, uh, 
uh, you know, the, the reckoning with the event and the, mm -hmm. the and dealing with it, uh, you know, using the space actually as a forum and relocating and finding niches there, you know, the, the hallway. Um, that sort of, uh, and then sort of finding out how like the, the space actually gets recreated. Um, I don't, don't know if in your book you sort of lead to this type of conclusion, but uh, for me it sort of points to a political evaluation of, of the, you know, maybe New York, maybe America. Um, I'm wondering if, if that's in your work and, and if you would maybe elaborate that. Are you say a political evaluation about? Well, so, you know, um, this competition between, you know, uh, the public sphere and commercial interests mm -hmm. and right. how it sort of gets played out. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's there. It, 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 it's a thread through the book. Um, and I kind of, I, it, mostly the book tells a story. It's a narrative. And so it's less argument based and more narrative driven. But I think what you see is a desire, you know, you can look at it cynically and I think you can look at it generously. Um, if we want to be cynical, which I have certainly been at times, you see the prioritizing of the commercial over almost everything else. And that's this listening to the city, um, I think illustrated that, you know, you had the goal was to get that solidified, make sure that would be stand and then everything else could come around that. But that was the most important piece. And all of this early on, the fence and the port authorities maneuverings with that was about making sure that that agenda could be realized. And so I think that, and I think that is a reality today and that's something but I think also there's a some degree of awareness about that and people are unsatisfied with that and so they push back and we also see that and but you know not always successfully but at least there's some attempt to engage with that and so you also though you have to reconcile the fact that there's a, an 8 acre memorial plaza they didn't simply put back office space so there was something more than just privatization and you know neoliberal capitalism taking over this space right there was something else there and it's it's crude i mean dividing the land in half <laughs> seems kind of like a crude answer but it is i think that reflects the conflict that we're going through right now as much as anything else so it does that you know if that's an answer so, so let me invite all of you to continue the conversation over some nice uh, food and drinks here, and um, also yeah. join me in, in thanking Elizabeth. Thanks. For and I'll be signing books. <laughs> um, she'll be she'll be signing books over there if anyone is interested.